everyone. Good evening. Good evening, Paul. Good evening, world. Good evening, patrons. Good evening. Cheers. Cheers. Mm. Mm. You've got ice in your drink. I have. It's summer, isn't it? Summer months. Got to cool down. <coughs> so, what do you got? I can see why you dress for summer. Shorts and t-shirts. I am. I'm very casual tonight. I feel looking at the. Uh, the camera here for our video viewers. I look a bit scruffy. To be Did you wear that to work today? No, I didn't work today. I was working at home. Oh. I was, uh, yeah, I was doing paperwork today at home. Okay. But here we are in London, London Village. In a pub called the Princess Louise, which boasts about never having updated its. Uh, what do you call it? Interior decor since 1891. I can't believe that though. It doesn't upstairs. We're upstairs in the dining room, and it, that wallpaper is never over 100 years old. I'm sorry. Really? I maybe. Whether it, what it maybe it's just certain parts of the decor. decor. The carpet. Sure, sure. Carpet. But, um, it does look old. The carpet. Probably, certainly, the furnishings downstairs look a bit more um, yeah. original. I mean, it's probably the same layout. That fireplace looks old. But yeah, not that fireplace old. maybe, yeah. But yeah, it's got a kind of, and it's men's urinals. Urinals? Urinals? Are listed, heritage listed, so they can't remove them. They can't change them. They can't adapt them? No. no. And I've, I've had a look, and they do look old. Do they? Marble. Uh, yeah, marble. Good quality stuff. They don't make Built them like that. Us. They don't make them like that anymore, Jeff, do they? Apparently not. Mm. We had, an we had an electrician man at home recently and um, he was trying to fix a uh, extractor fan in our downstairs toilet. Okay. I've done, done well for myself, got a downstairs toilet. <laughs> um, yeah, and he said, it, this, I think that, he, he was, we were talking about this, this extractor fan. It's not broken, it's just he had to rewire it when he was putting a new light in. I said, oh, that'll go for, that'll go for years. It's probably part of the original house, 1963 or something, that was put in. He said, oh, nothing wrong with that. That'll go forever, that, that extractor fan. And yeah, they don't, there is a lot of truth in the statement, they don't make them like they used to. Mm. Part of our throwaway culture. Yeah, exactly. Cheap, cheap, cheap. Yeah. Like the budget. Cheap it and replace it. Yeah, it's not, not things are not built around. It's kind of a throwaway culture, isn't it? I was asked about, I was in a taxi. Was I in a taxi the other day? I was somewhere. Somebody asked me what my thoughts were about the fast fashion industry, such as things like ASOS and yeah. places like that. Um, and they were, in many ways, they're at the sort of forefront of the agile movement, yeah. making the uh, the value chain of clothes manufacturing yeah. much shorter and leaner. And but they're getting a lot of stick, aren't they, about the effect on the environment? Yes. And the human aspects of the life cycle, I think, they're getting a lot of stick about. Yeah. Uh, I saw Sarah published uh, a statement today saying that by, I'm going to say 2021, might have been 2025, something like that, all of their clothes are going to be sustainable. Right. Or whatever that means. Right. So there's a lot of pressure on that. Um, and it's tough, isn't it? It's tough. The, the, the pressure on the whole life cycle. And then the supermarkets, the pressure on price. They squeeze the local farmers. Yeah which encourages bad practices, which encourages pesticides, which uh, makes it harder to get good yields, which increases the pressures again. It's a vicious cycle. It's like introducing technical debt into the, yeah. the product cycle. Yeah. And we're probably going to go full circle on a lot of this stuff. Now. So a lot of families as well. And something my, my daughter came home and asked the other day is that she wants to go back to um, glass milk bowls to have like milk deliveries. Okay. Because she goes back to that. She's had that. No, no, it's a, but she doesn't realise. But it's because obviously they're doing a big thing about single-use plastic at yeah. school and stuff, trying to cut down that. Um, be um, a bit more um, wary of it. And she, yeah, she's. I think a few more localised kind of dairies are starting to offer that service, and I think it's going to. It'll get a lot bigger. I saw a tweet Milk delivery. Long ago about. Um, you imagine a long time ago. Imagine a place where you get your food brought to you on an electric vehicle in recyclable bottles brought to your doorstep. Yeah. That was 40 years exactly, ago. Yeah, <laughs> exactly, yeah. Exactly. There's a milk float. Yeah. Not, not just milk either, orange juice, eggs. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Well, I don't know how we got into that. No, weird, wasn't it? That's a strange segue. Yeah. Segway yeah. is one of my favourite words. 
Is it? Have you ridden on a Segway? It's one of those words that um, somebody tweeted this the other way. I think it was Dave Grant tweeted about this the other day. Granty? Yeah. Um, about one of the words you didn't realise how it was spelt until like, quite long uh, through your life. Okay, yeah. yeah. So I didn't realise it. I always put a picture Segway as someone that rides around on. Yeah, you've probably seen that written more. Than, yeah. yeah, and that's, that's, probably, that's what I blame it on. Anyway, what are you drinking, mate? We haven't done that bit yet. No, true, true. Well, we, we've been in a couple of these types of pubs before, Sam Smith pubs, yeah. where they have um, their own... It's quite a limited choice. Is it a limited choice, would you say? It's quite a lot of ale, I think. It's just, you know, there's more than one lager, there's more than one ale, there's more than one bitter, there's more than one cider. Um, but yeah, you don't get your standard Carlsberg. No, it's um, some it's a bit all a bit different, isn't it? Yeah, their own, which I, I kind of I kind of like. Which yeah, I suppose is kind of traditional, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Uh, anyway, so what am I drinking? I think it's called Double Four. Uh, it's double fermented. Yeah. I don't really know what that means. Four. I think it's four percent. So maybe it's just. I can maybe. guess that for double fermented means it's been fermented yeah. twice, but I can't. Yeah. I don't understand what that means about. Why Double. that's a good thing or why it's a no. bad thing? I don't know. No. It's like triple cooked chips, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Maybe it's a you know that kind of gas. See, I kind of understand that, but I don't understand the double fermented. But it makes it makes chips sound more attractive. Yeah. So double. It's, this isn't just single. It's like Marks and Spencer. This, <laughs> this isn't just regular lager. This is double fermented lager. Yeah. I mean, it's smooth. Um, it's light. It's a bit fizzy. Creamy head. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's refreshing. It's a nice beer to have after a long, hot walk, I would say. It was a 10 minute walk, mate. It wasn't I know, I'm not saying I had a long, hot walk. I'm, you could have let that to the imagination of the listeners. <laughs> they didn't need to know that. Um, so, yeah, what about you? I've got, um, unsurprisingly, it's a cider, but it's pear cider well, today. That's, that's not a cider then, is it? What it says here, sparkling pear cider. Which is called? Perry. A Perry. But I thought you could still class it as a cider. Probably. Um, but yeah, it's very nice. It's uh, very cold, like a cold drink in, in, in the summer. It's a nice, uh, refreshing drop. That's for a nice 10 minute walk. Yes. Um, yeah, yeah, it is raining actually. Um, but no, it's very nice. Apparently though, it's brewed in Yorkshire. In a, a small independent British brewery. It doesn't say I assume it's, it's the Sam Smith, the old brewery, Tadcaster. So you can't really say that it tastes like apples to this. You're going to have to give us a better... Tastes like pears, mate. More in-depth. Tastes like pears. Does it? Yeah. When was the last time you had a pear? Today, or just now, drinking this. <laughs> OK. No, um, I don't know. I generally, I, I don't eat, I don't like pears. No, I'm not a fan of pears. I'm always quite wary of pears. If I had to cut a fruit... Out of your diet? Out of the world. Out of the world? Yeah, I'd, I'd cut a pear. Would you? Yeah. It's not high, it wouldn't be high on my I list. I can't think of many fruits that I, I like less to be honest. Really? Yeah. I don't like pear flavoured sweets. No, no, pear drops. No? That's not even real pear flavour, it's like no. artificial pear flavour. Yeah, they can't even do that. <laughs> anyway. Anyway, after my uh, fruit rant. I digress. Talking of rants, I was in the middle of a. I found myself in the middle of a rant this week. Yeah. Recently, I'm not sure it was this week. Where? On, and who on, with on who? Twitter. Oh, on the Twitter sphere. Yeah. A Twitter feud. Yeah, you put something out there and someone will find offence at it. Can't say anything these days, can you? What, what did you? What's got to be prepared what to did you say? have a debate What about. did you say what did, and who did you say it to? So, I, I tweeted a, um, say quite an excerpt, a very short excerpt from one of my books. And it says, Nobody's, nobody is inspired by a cynic. Great scrum masters are infectiously positive. Yes. And optimistic. Yes. And they embody the art of the possible and they role model the values and principles of greatness. Yes. So that was what I'd written and I, that's what I'd said. Uh, meant to be a bit of a, I suppose it was a bit of a, a point of reflection. Yeah, yeah. Um, maybe a, maybe a, for some people with inspiration, a little bit of a, Okay, yeah, all right, let's, let's be positive today. That kind yeah, of thing. glass half full yeah. kind of tweet. And I was met with, with a lot of um, backlash, I suppose. What, people disagreeing with that? Oh, yeah. Very strongly it, disagreeing with in, in what way? So the first, the first thing was about, I should probably read them out. And, and Name and shame. Just, but it's, <laughs> it's going to test my memory, and because a lot of this, I think, is how you interpret things, right? So people read that and interpreted 
in within it. Yeah. Okay? They put their own perceptions on it. Some of which perhaps I did mean, some of which perhaps I didn't. Yeah. So it'll be interesting for me to see you know, if other people are listening to this, they probably won't be. But what I interpreted from their tweets. So the first one was effectively saying, in t interpreting infectiously positive and enthusiastic as a happy clappy yes band. Yes. And saying how you know, someone who's always positive and overly enthusiastic and ungenuine, yes, in ingenuine in yeah. their enthusiasm is demotivating. And so, kind of in, almost suggesting that I'm, or implying that I'm suggesting that that's what I should be. Yeah. When in fact, what I'm thinking is, well, looking at a situation as, well, there is a way forward. Um, no situation is hopeless. Yeah. No situation is. Uh, beyond recovery yeah and it probably is more helpful to think of how, how you can move forward and what's, what's what's what you can get from it than thinking about how it's gone wrong and if you're looking at, for a leader then you're probably looking for someone who's who's positive I, I'm saying well I think also if you're looking for change if you're looking for to and, and by definition projects are change aren't they regardless of what they're doing yeah. you're looking to build something you're looking to change something so to, to go from one state to another in my opinion and I'm well I'm agreeing with you but in what in, in well, maybe you should maybe for maybe podcast, maybe because it will be a pretty boring podcast if yeah. I didn't all right okay I'll go with that right right I disagree <laughs> <laughs> yeah okay so well we can't we can't be positive all the time though, right no we can't be positive all the time uh, and sometimes a, a very a serious situation you've got to take you have to take a glass half full uh, empty view, yeah. viewpoint yeah look at all the worst case of what could happen yeah and so I tried to add a little extra context to my 140 character yeah. statement and saying how I think there's a difference between cynicism and a cynic all right, explain. And I think cynicism is a valuable trait. Yes. Because if you can adopt a cynic, cynical mindset, cynical approach, it allows you to identify risk, it allows you to identify all the ways things can go wrong, it stops you being naive um, and making silly mistakes that could have been easily avoided. But if you are a cynic, then... Does that mean you're constantly... Um, yeah. It means it's a, an unalterable state. Yeah, and I think people... There are people who wear that as a sort of badge of honour. Yeah. You know, I'm a grumpy old so and so. Yeah. Um, and I think that that, in my experience, they don't tend to make great team members. They drag people down. Whereas, being able to step into the mindset of a cynic and be cynical for a while is very valuable. So I'm trying to make a differentiation between being cynical and being a cynic. What about people that can't help it? I think everyone can. Oh, I don't know about that. I think, I think, I think, um, my mother, yeah. right, um, certainly, I'm pretty sure my mum doesn't listen to this podcast, so I can be, I can be brutally honest there. Cheers, Mrs. G. <laughs> um, cynical, uh, what is cynical, what is, what, what is the definition of a cynic? Well, that was an interesting thing, actually. I don't know that I'll be able to bring this because up. Because I don't want to label my mother a cynic, if, if actually, in actual fact she isn't. Okay. But my mum, while you're doing that, my mum is just a very, very negative, very negative, has a negative outlook, especially in her later years, has, has had a very negative outlook on most things. It's, and, and just seems to naturally fall into looking at all of the problems that might occur in daily life. I don't, and I don't think, the reason why I said that is I don't think she can help it. I, th I just think that's how she's wired. And I don't even think that she realises how much she's, she does it sometimes. Well, that is an important final statement. Because if she doesn't realise she's doing it, she might not realise the consequences for her and others of doing it. And if it's unconscious, then she's not making a choice. Mm. Whereas if she was conscious of it and was able to see the consequences of it, then she may then make a choice to try something different. But we do point it out to her. We do try and point out the consequences to her, but it doesn't... She doesn't. She, I think. I think she's aware of it, but she just finds finds it very hard to change it. So, somebody tweeted me a definition. Um, so I think there was there was an element of, well, is there a universal definition of this? So we said, well, yes, there is. And they 
quoted uh, a definition from, let's say, the Cambridge Dictionary. Or something. Right, okay. And I said, I see that as a definition, but, not. but I don't think that's necessarily a universal decision. Yeah. But then, you know, maybe I'm being picky about that. But anyway, so the definition that comes up when you Google it is a person who believes, a cynic is a person who believes that other people are motivated purely by self interest rather than acting for honourable or unselfish reasons. Um, an ostentatious contempt for ease and pleasure. Right. I, when I wrote about cynicism, I wrote about it from the, the point of view of looking at things as glass half empty. Yeah. Uh, assuming negative intentions of other people rather than assuming positive intentions. Um, the natural state of finding despair rather than joy. Yeah. Unfulfillment instead of happiness. Um, finding all the, the focusing on all the things that went wrong rather than things that went well. Okay. That wasn't what well, that said. No, 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 no. That, yeah. So that's what I'm saying. When so I your definition started, that, was my, that was what I was looking for. Yeah. Uh, so I think all traits of value. What I would say to use your, to use your mother's example there, the example of your mother that you gave. I would say her cynicism traits out of balance. I say it's overdone. Yeah. So whereas in the past she's got some value from that, I think she she's missing out on the potential value of being able to step out of the cynical mindset. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And awareness is the first step. Now, uh, is she aware that she's, that she's doing this? Is she, does she see any value in changing and being able to adopt a different mindset? Yeah. I think so. I think to answer that, I think she is aware of it. But the second step in that is regulate it. I don't think she knows how to um, adjust it. Okay. So knowing how is, yeah. is the third step. Yeah. The, se- the middle step is the import- is really important in that. Is does she want to? Yes. Does she see any yeah, potential true. value yeah. in regulating it and experimenting with something different? There's there's potential step one and a half. Which is, are there some examples where she is a cynic? Is yeah, there yeah. Some situation, even what? It's quite easy to label people, isn't yeah. it? As, as constantly, yeah, yeah. Now, if there's one type of situation where she isn't, yeah. we could look at well, what is it about that type of situation that encourages yeah. different responses, different yeah. processing, and we can perhaps magnify that and leverage that for others. Uh, so yeah, it was. It's difficult in there. Um, I'll, I'll I'll throw another okay. spanner in your works. Yeah, yeah. About, I think it, again to to play the devil's advocate here. I think it can unite people. Yeah. Cynicism, and I think maybe we're a little bit biased because I think it's quite a British thing as well. I think we are naturally we we tend to common struggle. Mm-hmm. That kind of idea that we're in this together and it's yeah. all shit yeah. and we've got to fight it together and we're all you know kind of yes that kind of and I think we're a bit a little bit. We take an element of pride in that as well, that it's easier perhaps sometimes to bitch and moan and complain and almost feel that you can gain friends who've got that common struggle yeah. rather than trying to, it's, it's sometimes harder to lift people up. Oh, it's definitely harder to lift people up, definitely. And I think there is a, there is a, there's a right fear about this idea of the happy clappy, you know, everything's amazing when it's not. That, that's a right fear, that's a just fear. The, the bonding together, I think, is, is valuable. I think it's a good thing. And we can, we often call it the siege mentality as well. This idea of, you know, everything, everyone's against us, everyone's yeah. out to get us. And it makes us feel stronger and brings a bonding. Um, but it's, it's, it does create defensiveness. Yeah, and that sort of hunker down yeah. mentality. So you lose your creativity, you lose safety. People don't feel safe to try things because they're expecting to fail. And I remember we've, we've mentioned him before, but the guy that we call Ian, who was probably one of these most cynical people that we've ever worked with. Yeah, who openly said to me, "Yeah, everything's shit, Jeff. I'd rather fail with what I know than what I don't know." Just assuming that failure is going to happen, it's not even worth trying. And was, was that true then that he failed? I know he perhaps wasn't in a leadership position, but did people tend to get rally behind him or did people tend to no. move themselves away from him? And so he had been in the organisation longer than anybody else. Yeah. 
and he was still at the same grade that he was at when he entered the company. Yeah. He hadn't progressed, yeah. and he was quite bitter about the fact that he hadn't progressed, uh, but there was no, nobody would follow him. There was no reason to follow him. Yeah. Why would you follow him? Because that's a different... There's nothing to follow. Bitterness is a different thing, isn't it? So bitterness... Um, isn't this, for me is a different something different to cynicism. Bitterness almost su suggests that there's there's an element of jealousy or envy from what someone else or so, or something else, or some another company is doing or another individual is doing. But that's different to just out and out everything shit. So to me, that's bitterness of the world. Yeah, and I think there's there's a. It takes a bit of time to get there. I wonder if it's so. I wonder if it's previous. Ex if people, are, is it nature or nurture? Is it is it is it something that people? Do you think it's a trait people are born with, or do you think it's a something you build? If, do you think cynicism is something that you grow that grows on you? I'm not really qualified to, to answer that very well, but I'll give you my opinion, which is that I think some people are more prone to, for example, depression, and that has an impact on your mood and how you yeah. interpret things. And that's kind of a, a genetic thing, I believe. Um, but I think the environment is a massive part of that as well. If you're brought up in an environment where your parents are very negative and very cynical, you'll, you role model. You role model people that you see as leaders in your life and your parents are leaders, like it or not. But I, so I think, so we came from a company called British Telecom where there was a history of um, well, uh, yeah, let's be honest, there was a history of failure is a strong word, but um, delay and kind of f changing initiatives and constant flux. Yeah. That can be quite unnerving for people. I think that can have an impact on people's bitterness, bitterness at the company yeah. um, in terms of then it becomes a struggle against their employer for, for many people in that company as well. And it's a kind of that, yeah, that siege mentality. We've got to look after ourselves here because no one else is looking after ourselves. Yeah. And I'm not, I'm not going to go the extra mile for the company because they've never gone the extra mile for me. Yeah. So um, I think that's united a lot of people that we used to work with about the common struggle the, the, in the pub, like now, moaning about how difficult life is mm -hmm. and work is. Yeah, and that, I, think, I, think it, I think it does grow, grow on people. Certainly... Maybe it's, I don't know, I'm not qualified enough to say either, but certainly with my mum, I can talk about my mum, and it's something that's changed with age, I think. Yeah. It's something that's um, perhaps she's struggled with more as she's got older. Yeah. I think that's, that's, that's quite normal. You do tend to see more... As your life experiences grow, maybe. Yeah, you do tend to see more failures, and the failures tend to hurt more, and they yeah. tend to stay with you longer, and where you've been let down by people, or fate, or luck, or whatever you want to call it. I think that those stay in the memory, uh, and so you, you'll have just more, that, that tally chart will be longer. I'll give you a different example, this is to do with me. I've got a, an Achilles problem, right, okay. in my leg. Um, don't really know how I did it. Um, I've got a, a physio mate who had a look at it, and he, he thinks it was through, get this, he thinks it was through overuse, <laughs> me, running too much. <laughs> um, but what's, what does, and this, I use the phrase get me down, what, what brings me down is the length of time it's taking to get better. And that, that has an impact on me personally, my, my outlook, my, everything seems like, as, as I'm getting older, everything seems like it's taking longer to do. And I think that brings, brings you down, that, that kind of allows this negativity, this bitterness to grow, certainly within me. And I think so, my... <laughs> but impatience, maybe. When you get so, I was, I was listening today to a, a podcast, the Badass Agile podcast. Yeah, yeah. And he was talking about um, getting in the funk and trying to get out of the funk. Yeah. And I think it's quite important to realise when you are in a funk and get out. And I think that's part of this one, Master's role. Yeah. I mean, bring this all the way back to the, the reason I first wrote it a long time ago is that uh, change in an organisation is hard. It's difficult. You can't see the end of the tunnel. You have to do. You have to almost take a leap of faith in a way. Um, you have to look at yourself and 
reflect and improve and move forward. And that's that's very difficult. Very difficult. And there's going to be some bumps along the way. And it's quite easy to focus on those bumps and think, you know, well, this is never going to happen. This is never. We're never going to see the end of this. We're never going to get there. But as a, if you've got, if a scrum master can't keep that sort of positive attitude, you know what? It will be. Okay. Yes, it's difficult. Yeah. You know, not blind, stupid, naive optimism, but real, pragmatic optimism. Of, yes, it's difficult, and it will get better. Mm -hmm. I think if the scrum master can't do that, and if a leader can't do that, then we've got no hope. Mm. There is just no chance of success. Mm. And that's part of their role. A, a funk, a negative attitude, could be an impediment. Yeah. To put it that way. Um, having said all that, they're only human. And as you quite rightly said in your first argument against me, you can't be positive all the time. No, you can't. So, when you were a scrum master of a team, and you weren't feeling particularly optimistic or positive, what did you do? I don't know, I'm trying to think now. I, I think I used to... I'm quite, yeah. I, I, I am. Um, I work quite a lot off other people as well, so I might take myself out of that situation. I see, well, I'm trying to think of a, perhaps a more recent example that. Um, where was I? Plays a huge part. I, I consciously. Well, I can't remember what was the useless story, but I was, I was, I basically just switched everything off, and that, in terms of, closed my laptop, turned my phone off. I think I went out for a walk or something. I was, I was outdoors and I was consciously trying to look around for stuff that, um, to distract me. So to, and it was something my, I think my daughter said at the time and that, that element of real, realism that, you know what, there's, bi there's bigger things at stake here. Because yeah. when, it's, when it's something in particular that's getting me down, my kids or my, my home life, my, my family environment, just take stock for a minute and think, hang on a minute, you've got a lot to be positive about here. There's a lot more going on than just that particular issue. So trying to widen my perspective consciously is what I try to do now. I can't honestly remember if I used to do that before, but that's what keeps me... <laughs> oh yeah, we all have bad days. We all have days when we feel like the prover you've got like the proverbial one side of bed. But, um, I think I just tried to realise that there's more at stake. And even in when you've got negative experiences at work, there's still a lot more, there should be a lot more other things going on that you can draw energy from. Yeah. Whether it's people or whether it's just environment, a different yeah. environment, different experience. I think that's quite, personally, I think that's quite important. So that self awareness of how do I recharge myself, how do I replenish myself? How do I realise that I am in that place and I you know, I need to step out and look after myself? Yeah. I use the phrase, fit your own oxygen mask before you fit others. Uh, because you can't help other people if you don't help yourself. If you're not in a good place. You haven't got energy to give. Yeah. You have no use to anyone. So, how do you do that as a scrum master if you're the one expected to do that? Well, you have, in most places, there's more than one scrum master. Yeah. So, having that community, having someone that you can... Even if it's just vent, just get it off your chest. Nobody has to do anything, just hear you. Yeah. you. If it's go outside, get a walk, get in touch with nature. If it's shut off, go and have a bath. If it's go for a run, whatever it is. If you know what works for you, then you can engage in it. Well, we've said this before, my wife got a... <laughs> I, I won't go into this whole story behind this, but my wife's got a punch bag in the garage. <laughs> so when things, when things get really stressful at home... My face on it. I'm sure it's nothing to do with me. <laughs> but uh, when things get quite stressful at home, that's it, I, I'll have to say this isn't the reason why she bought the punch bag, because it's for fitness and stuff like that. But she's got a pair of boxing gloves in the garage, and it's particularly if, I'll blame it on the kids, if the kids have been running right all day or if they're particularly difficult, she will, um, she used to, <laughs> when my kids were really little, she's just got to lock herself in the, in the cupboard or something and scream at the top of her voice, okay. step out the room, scream, because yeah. screaming is quite therapeutic, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, kind of, and uh, we tell my boy to, if he's hurt himself, or if he's angry, go and scream into the pillow, or go and punch the pillow or something like that, just to try and get that, get that energy out of you, mm. and then you can, cold shower works as well. Yeah. 
I know. I'm starting to get a big more more and more fans of uh, a big fan of Cold Shower. I know a qualified and licensed laughter therapist. Right. Okay. Teaches you to laugh. Yeah. And use that energy to turn that laughter, that, turn that energy that would have been a scream for your wife into exaggerated laughter. Yeah. Deliberate laughter. Deliberate laughter. Yes, whatever that's, works, really. It's good, yeah, yeah. Um, so when I look back at that tweet, and obviously we all have responsibility for the messages that we're getting out there in the world, I was directly taking it from text. Uh, so if I was going to change it, then I'd have to rewrite the book, I suppose. But would I change that? Uh, I suppose in an ideal world, I probably would. Uh, mainly because I do encourage people to never use the word never, never <laughs> or always or nobody or everyone and I myself use the word nobody nobody is inspired by a sin well there you go so I would say most people are not inspired by well it's fair to say you're not correct but I'm not own it sensitive to the population. yeah and it was a it was a somewhat of a generalization I still believe somewhere in the region of 99% of people aren't inspired by a cynic. What about someone like Brian Clough? Would you say he's cynical? He was cynical? I'm trying to think of like kind of very outwardly... I mean, we are really splitting our audience down to a very small portion <laughs> here. Who, who knows Brian Clough? Not many people um, know Brian Clough. I'm just trying to think of a fairly kind of iconic yet more dour, cynic, but I cynical think that manner. Says the fact that you can't really think of one very no, easily. No, I know, I suppose, yeah. Says a lot. I think the public, or the, maybe the persona in the media, is very different to how they deal with people on a day by day basis, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, Alan Sugars. Yes. Alan Sugar is, is a good example. Lord Sugar. Uh, again, pr would that translate to our uh, international audience? Maybe, probably not. Alan Sugar is the former. I don't think he's. Is he still in charge? Is he still in. Amstrad? He's a fairly big media mogul in, um, in the UK. Been, he he's, comes across as very cynical. He's, he has a, perso a, a, a persona of belligerent, grumpy old old boss, but very successful, and at the top of his game commercially and you know as a as a business thinker. Um, he's part of he's he basically was the Donald Trump version in the UK version of The Apprentice. I I would I would like to see out of a hundred people family fortunes time. <laughs> We surveyed 100 people. Mm. How many of them would prefer to work for Alan Sugar as opposed to Richard Branson? That's a great question. Maybe we should Twitter poll that on our uh, Agile podcast. Let's do that. So we'll do that. Where after this goes out, we'll put that Twitter poll out and we'll see what people think. Nice, I like that. Yeah. So all else being equal, so the job's the same, the location's the same, the yeah. pay's the same, everything's the same. The only thing is you would be working for one of those two people. And we'll see, we'll tell you on later podcast what the result was. Good place to stop, I think. That's nice. Uh, I'm a bit slow on the old pint tonight. That's but, all right. um, Glass half empty and all that. <laughs> oh, nice work. <laughs> Cheers, mate. Cheers, everybody. Cheers. That's good.